Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you having a fantastic Friday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. And if you're new here on Fridays, we do things a little bit differently. On Fridays, I try to cover some of the stories we try to get to earlier in the week, but for time reasons, we weren't able to get to as well as more viewer requested stories. And so with that said, let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about in what company is coming under fire today news, we had Jack in the Box. And the reason for the backlash is Jack in the Box came out with a new advertisement. They have a new campaign and it was apparently so bad. It inspired David Griner, the creative and innovation editor for Adweek to write an article titled, Jack in the Box just launched one of the most tone deaf ads of the Me Too era. And here is what he was talking about. I'm the only one with the bowls to serve something different. I mean, just look at my teriyaki bowls. What about these bowls, Jack? Hey, you got some pretty nice bowls there. And so does Dan. Thanks, Jack. Those are some nice bowls. Everyone's gonna wanna get their hands on Jack's bowls. Come try my bowls! Jack, the lawyers aren't comfortable with the new marketing campaign. Why? People love my bowls. See that right there? You can't say that. I can't say people love my bowls? No. What about try my bowls? Nope. Check out my bowls? Absolutely not. And my personal response to this is, really? You're trying to make this commercial a Me Too thing to, to generate outrage? It's dumb, silly humor, which David Griner even says, let's get this out of the way. Yes, juvenile humor is still okay. Kmart shit my pants spot is still as funny, charming, and joyously silly as it was in 2013. But David also goes on to say, in perhaps its most telling moment, the ad tries to go meta by having a lawyer explain to Jack that the campaign is inappropriate. But in a commendably accurate portrayal of male executives, he doesn't understand what the fuss is about. Oh good, a negative, broad statement in a debate. Those are always so helpful. Now, as far as Jack in the Box and the ad agency's response to this backlash, they issued a joint statement saying, as a brand known by its fans for its tongue-in-cheek, playful sense of humor, this ad is simply a creative and humorous expression around the teriyaki bowl product. It intends to highlight how a burger brand such as Jack in the Box dares to go beyond the usual fast food fare and serve something different. What I'll say is personally, even though I don't eat at Jack in the Box, so I'm not like a fan of Jack in the Box, I think it's great that they stuck by their commercial and they didn't just cower down because because some people on the internet got angry. And also a thing I want to note is it's not even an original innovative idea, the whole bowls thing. Right, like the play on words where he's saying something but everyone's thinking, oh, balls. I mean, the one that instantly comes to mind for me is the Saturday Night Live sketch they've gone back to several times, sweaty balls. No one can resist my sweaty balls. It was one of SNL's most memorable and loved sketch to the point that Ben & Jerry's even released a flavor called sweaty balls. But you know what, actually, maybe David Griner is right. Maybe we need to get this toilet humor this garbage from Jack off the internet. And you know what? I think that we could start a grassroots movement to really make this a thing. So if you agree with David Griner, what I say is go to your Twitter. Tweet that you support David at Griner with the hashtag Jack off the internet because that's where people want you to go. I'm a, I'm a stupid child sometimes. Dude, did you know that I sometimes film these really late on Thursday? Just slowly slipping into madness, wondering if people are actually outraged or they're just trying to generate views, get attention, or if anything really matters. But the main point of this story is, who are we talking about? Jack! Where do we want him to go? Off the internet! Say it loud, say it proud. And then let's talk about the Oscars. There are some changes happening, and thus some controversy. So yesterday, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences sends out this letter to their members where they announce some huge changes to the Oscars. And they announce three main things. One, it's a three-hour telecast. Two, there is now an earlier air date. And three, there is a new award category. And most likely, these changes are all related to a viewership problem. Last year's show was viewed by 26.5 million people, which sounds like a massive number. The show was only second to that of the Super Bowl, but their numbers were actually down 20% from 2017. And most importantly for them, it's actually the lowest number of people watching the Oscars since they started tracking it in 1975. So three hour show, how are they gonna do it? They're already trying to rush people through their speeches. Well, they plan on giving out awards without a break, which means that awards will be given out during commercial breaks. And although the Academy hasn't announced which categories would not be broadcast live, many experts are saying it's probably gonna be for categories like sound, Sound editing, production design. But the Academy says that they will not be cut entirely. They will actually tape and edit the acceptance speeches and then broadcast them at some point. And so unsurprisingly, people who work in categories like sound, makeup, film, editing, they're calling the changes demeaning. Then too, regarding the earlier show, next year's show is already set for February 24th, so this change won't take place until 2020. But in 2020, the Academy plans to hold their show earlier in the traditional award season. But then finally, three, what is this new category and why is it being seen as the most controversial of the three? Well, here's exactly what the Academy's letter to a member said, we will create a new category for outstanding achievement in popular film. Eligibility requirements and other key details will be forthcoming. And there's been a lot of big reactions to this. I mean, the Academy and the Oscars in general have been criticized for being out of touch with everyday Americans. Often honoring movies most of the general public has not seen, even the hosts of the show joking about that. So did you see any of the Oscar nominated movies? You see a uh, Spotlight? No. 
What the hell is that? No, I didn't see that movie. And so almost every time you have a lot of people angry saying the Oscars snubbed popular films, particularly big superhero films. I mean, you might remember there was a lot of controversy back in 2008 when Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight wasn't nominated for Best Picture. And more recently you have movies like Deadpool completely shut out of Oscar nominations. And while some superhero movies like Michael Keaton's Batman, Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man 2, The Incredibles have won Oscars, people have pointed out there's never been a superhero comic book adaptation to ever get nominated for Best Picture. And so it appears this new category is meant to address that criticism, but also at the same time maybe pull in new viewers. But there's been pushback. You have some people saying the Oscars don't need this category because big budget popular films can actually get nominated and they can win when they're good. People pointing to Titanic, Chicago, Lincoln. People saying The Dark Knight being snubbed was a rare outlier. But then you also have people that are fearful that the category is going to make it hard for big budget films to win Best Picture. All of a sudden there's this whole new thing that puts you in a completely different category. But also to be clear, the Academy confirmed to The Hollywood Reporter that a film can be eligible for both of these categories. And more specifically, in the now, there are many people worried about how this is going to affect the movie Black Panther. Black Panther is one of the highest grossing films of all time, and before yesterday's announcement, it was considered a possible contender for Best Picture. But now with the most popular category, people are saying the Academy just gave themselves an easy out. Black Panther would be the obvious favorite to win most popular. And so if a movie like that is so obviously going to win there, let's say it gets nominated for both, then for Best Picture, they might vote for something that might not get as much attention, and or it'll just make it more likely that a movie like Black Panther won't even get nominated for Best Picture because it's a big budget movie. But what are individuals saying? Well, Variety Awards editor Christopher Tapley said, this is desperation. Here comes the Academy establishing a corner to which voters can banish Black Panther and other films like it with a pat on the head and a thanks for playing. Then you had actor Rob Lowe saying on Twitter, the film business passed away today with the announcement of the popular film Oscar. It had been in poor health for a number of years. It has survived by sequels, tent poles, and vertical integration. And the category also sparked the hashtag Oscars so stupid. But there I would say the Academy is most likely relieved at the, uh, the de-escalation of their hashtag this year. Now, all of that said, as far as my personal reaction, I kind of just don't care. As far as declining viewership, it might be because more and more people are just watching things on the internet or feel completely okay with not watching a three hour event. And they're completely content with just watching the one minute or less video clips that'll pop up on Twitter one to two minutes after they happen, only giving the categories they care about attention, or just looking at a list of the winners later that night or the next morning, along with a list of standout moments. I don't know, to me this makes about as much sense as uh, the Golden Globes combining musical or comedy. Like why would you take those two different categories put them together, and then in 2015, give it to the movie The Martian. But whatever, I'll pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts about these changes here? But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today, and today in Awesome, brought to you by Postmates. And Postmates, if you don't know, is the fantastic delivery on demand app. You want some from the store, your favorite restaurant, boom, just open up the app and they will deliver to your house, your work, your wherever. It is one of the ultimate conveniences for me. It has been a game changer. And actually for you, if you've never tried it before, there's no better time. One, if you go to postafranco.com, you download the Postmates app, make sure you enter an offer code Philly D, and they will give you $100 in free delivery credit. And two, if you've wanted to use the app, it wasn't available to you, they just launched 100 new cities, so definitely check it out. And the first bit of awesome is if you don't have HBO or your friend's HBO Go login that he forgot that he gave you a long time ago, HBO has released the first full episode, the season premiere of this year's Hard Knocks. And if you don't watch the series, I, I would recommend you, you do it. There, there are a few gems every season. That said, to this day, my favorite person on Hard Knocks ever is William Hayes. If you don't know who that is, that is a Rams player who believes that mermaids are real and that dinosaurs never happen. And I'm just gonna leave you with that, that there is a monetarily successful person in this world that believes that. Then we have Vanessa Hudgens trying nine things she's never done before. We got a small tease for the movie Slenderman. We have the fantastic donkey taking on spy party. Then we got some Bo Burnham on James Corden talking about some haters. Then we got a comedy short from the BBC with a fantastic Catherine Tate, Amelia Clark, Felicity Jones, Hiddleston, and, and many more. Also, Separately from this video, since we mentioned Catherine Tate, I feel like it's just my duty, even though I'm in the minority. Catherine Tate is by far the best companion in the Doctor Who series. Don't at me. Then we had YouTuber Kevin Perry showing us 50 ways to be a YouTuber. Then we got a new trailer for The Nutcracker and The Four Realms. Then we had Mac Miller on NPR Music doing a Tiny Desk concert. Then we got a season two teaser for The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Which, by the way, if you do have an Amazon Prime account, I highly recommend you watch the first season. It's great. Then, in just happy 
see someone else's success, awesome, I wanted to just mention really quickly Andre Turbia. If you don't know that name, he is the former editor of SourceFed Animated. His channel's just been crushing it over the past two months, and he's about to pass a million subscribers. And I'm just so genuinely excited for him in general, but also the fact that he's he's gonna pass this the seven-figure mark. And if you haven't checked him out yet, I highly recommend you check his newest videos out and also subscribe. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. Then in a why, why do you even ask these questions news? I had people linking me to two articles. One was from TMZ, the other was from Sports Illustrated. Although I do have to give a tip of the hat to Sports Illustrated who titled the article, Professional Attention Seeker Logan Paul Wants to Fight in UFC. And the whole story is just based around this TMZ sports clip where they're talking about, you know, what, what is Logan Paul gonna do after the KSI fight? And he says this. I wanna fight a UFC fighter. I wanna, I wanna, oh, I wanna for get, real? Get yeah, bro, I wrestled oh, my whole life. You wanna do, oh, you guys be down to do this sort of stuff for real? For real, for real, if, for real. Yeah, absolutely, bro. There's no reason I can't. I literally did athletics my whole life. You call someone out. Who would you want to fight in the UFC? CM Punk. <laughs> I, don't like that. I think he'd win that, bro. I think it'd be dope to see one of us fight McGregor. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> as far as my reaction to that, to the polls saying they want to fight a UFC fighter. One, Logan mentioning CM Punk is actually smart because it's pr he's probably one of the only people he could legitimately fight. But that's not saying much if you've seen CM Punk's two fights in the UFC. But then also, too, the, the mention of Conor McGregor, obviously, that, that's meant to get headlines. Understand me when I say this. In the octagon, if you are not a trained professional, Professional UFC fighter, you will lose. And I'm not, I'm not talking about the, the the Daniel Cormier's, the Conor McGregor's of the world. Literally, the lowest rung UFC fighter will destroy most people. But even with that said, there are already two fighters that said they're down. You have Elias Theodoro who says, "I volunteer my services." Smiley face. But then you also had Mike Jackson who recently fought CM Punk, who tweeted, "You have more important shit to handle. I got this." But the thing is, it's not like it's an impossibility that this could happen. And I'm saying this, and I hope. Hopefully I, it doesn't come off like I'm trying trying to disrespect. But I think the prime example of Dana White and the UFC willing to do something that maybe doesn't make sense, you have CM Punk. In both fights it looked like he did not belong there, but the move was made because they wanted to make a documentary, they wanted the sales, and based off of how many people end up buying the pay-per-view between KSI and Logan Paul, Maybe they think that those numbers will move there. That said, maybe I'll be of a different mindset after we see this first fight. But actually, a question that I want to pass off to you, especially if you are a fan of the UFC, what are your thoughts about these kind of odd spectacle fights like the CM Punk attempt? Do you feel like it's good because it takes people that weren't necessarily fans of the UFC, pay-per-view buyers for the UFC, and it introduces them? Or no, do you think it's a stupid cash grab that ends up just making the UFC look stupid, especially when the fights end up being like CM Punk's fights? Or maybe are you in the middle and you think think that maybe it is worth that risk. I'd love to know. And then let's talk about what's happening in Indonesia. If you didn't see, this past Sunday there was a 6.9 earthquake at the north end of the island of Lombok. And if you've ever traveled to Indonesia, you might recognize the island because it's across from Bali. And according to reports, the tremor hit the island's relatively poor and remote northern mountainous region. And to make matters even worse, this was the second major earthquake to hit the island in a week. On July 29th, there was a 6.4 earthquake that killed more than a dozen. And so with last Sunday's earthquake, not only was it stronger, but it was much more shallow, meaning that the potential for it to shake and damage structures was far worse. And as of right now, it is unclear exactly how many people died because of Sunday's earthquake, but Indonesia's top security minister told reporters that the death toll was 319, but there have also been reports as high as 347. But also a thing to note is officials on the scene are saying the death count is very likely to rise as they find bodies among the rubble. And on top of that, according to the National Disaster Management Agency, 1,447 people were injured and 165,000 plus have been displaced. And in fact, the government thinks that over 20,000 will be in need of major long-term assistance. And that's unsurprising because making matters even worse, making it more difficult for rescues, this week there have been strong aftershocks, including a 5.9 magnitude aftershock on Thursday. And really the only thing that was lucky from the, the earthquake on Sunday is that there was not a tsunami that followed. The tsunami that can follow an earthquake is one of the things that makes the coastal earthquakes far worse. That's how you get horrific tragedies like the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake. There, over 200,000 people lost their lives because of the tsunami that followed. But even without the tsunami, this was devastating to Lombok and nearby islands. And northern Lombok was hit the hardest. Reportedly, 80% of the buildings have been destroyed in most of the area's villages. And according to reports, most of the deaths were caused by collapsing buildings. You had many people dying in mosques while they were attending morning prayers. As I mentioned earlier, the region is relatively poor, which also means that many of the buildings in the area are not meant to handle these earthquakes. Even on top of that, many of the buildings were already weakened from the July 29th earthquake. And we've also seen rescue workers have just had their hands full trying to help out stranded Indonesians and tourists. Off the coast of Lombok are the Gili Islands, and they were reportedly filled with 
with tourists after power went out and amenities were essentially cut off. One Indonesian official tweeting out, foreign and domestic tourists are awaiting to get evacuated. No casualties reported. Evacuation process is conducted in stages due to the lack of ships. Our team will add more ships. And there you just see how overwhelming the situation is with all of these people trying to get off the island at the same time. But also with this story, we saw news outlets being criticized over their coverage. And it wasn't necessarily because there were places that did not cover this, but because of what the focus was. There were news sites highlighting that Chrissy Teigen was vacationing in Bali and live tweeting the earthquake. She had tweeted things like, Bali, trembling, so long. Oh man, we are on stilts. It felt like a ride. 15 solid seconds of holy shit, this is happening. I very calmly walked outside saying, clutching baby, saying, I'm naked, I'm naked, I'm naked, like a naked zombie. And I'm not talking about outlets like TMZ or the Daily Mail. I'm talking about like the Boston Globe and Fox News. And so you had a lot of people saying, really, this is the, this is the focus of this article. Additionally, we also saw people criticizing Tegan for the live tweeting. Some saying she was being narcissistic, others saying that she wasn't being serious enough about this. You also had people defending Chrissy Teigen saying, you know, how was she supposed to know that it was that horrible? And I will say personally, I think that is a completely valid defense. In California, whether it be the slightest rumbling or something somewhat meaningful, you see everyone on Twitter just throwing something out. And in those moments, there's really no way to know the actual impact. And regarding those news sites that had focused on her tweets, she asked the news sites to stop using them and to highlight those who need help, saying, please don't make any more news stories mentioning us. Talk about those in danger and share information to help those in need. Which is an incredibly valid point because Lombok is still experiencing aftershocks. They are still in need of aid. You've got local authorities on the scene and relief organizations are taking donations. You have the International Red Cross and Crescent Federation. They have their Indonesian Red Crescent on scene. And I'll link to those donation links down below. And with this story, I want to kind of end it with two things. One, obviously my heart and my thoughts go out to everyone affected by these earthquakes. But then also to what do you think about the coverage of Chrissy Teigen in relation to this story? For me covering it now, I thought it was a very interesting angle after the fact, specifically the news coverage of it and the general reaction. Do you think it was a stupid garbage move by these outlets? Or do you think it was a smart marketing move to make people who might not have cared about an international story care? I mean, it's something that we've talked about on this show before. How do you make people care about international stories with people that they might not feel connected to. That's a struggle that a lot of journalists and writers have, so does Chrissy Teigen, because she is such a notable figure, open the door to the full story? My thoughts are maybe, although it, it's hard to see that with Fox News having headlines like, Chrissy Teigen live tweets reveals she was naked during massive earthquake in Bali. But I don't know. That's my opinion, and so that's why I pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts here? And that's where we're going to end today's show, and of course, remember, this is the Philip DeFranco show. It is also a conversation. And whether it be the last story, the first one, anything in between, let me know what you're thinking in the comments down below. Also, while you're at it, if you like this video, you like these daily weekday videos, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. But that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you Monday. Almost said tomorrow again. I don't need those tweets this week.